Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're all very tired. It's now 12 minutes to 8 o'clock. And to be frank, I think this piece of legislation is so very important, so very critical, underscored by the fact that the responsible minister has just indicated that this is the first of its type of legislation for the Eastern Caribbean, that it would have been so much better if this piece of legislation was debated when perhaps solution people could have listened to us and our contributions. And because of the enormous challenges, among other things, that, that face us. So there is some disappointment on my part that we are debating this bill at a very late hour um, when perhaps our energies have been sapped a little and they are at a rather low ebb. That having been said, Mr. Speaker, I just want to add my voice um, to debate, to the debate, but in a in in a, in, in a very li limited way, um, just to highlight a few issues that I regard as important and perhaps necessary to highlight, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to confirm and confess that I rather like the introduction made by the by the minister, by the member for Denry North as he put the bill into into context and he was absolutely correct to draw the attention of the House and the public at large to what is happening to us worldwide and indeed um, sharing with us our own experiences whether it is um, tropical storm Brett or other weather systems and uh, I am also very pleased too that he touched on all my own constituency before South, to which I shall return to in a few moments. Mr. Speaker, when the St. Lucia Liberal Party won the elections in 2011, and I was in the process of constructing the then cabinet of ministers I recall I wanted to name the Ministry with Responsibility for Climate Matters as the Ministry of Climate Change and Environmental Affairs. I had intended then that it would have been a separate and distinct ministry for a number of reasons. One, to bring across to the people of St. Lucia the real dangers we face with climate change and to compartmentalize, to put focus and direction and energy into the issues regarding climate change. And secondly, the conjuncture was just perfect, just right, because money was becoming available for matters of climate change. It is true that the world had not come to accept the principles of loss and damage because it was floated in Paris during the talks on climate change. Um, it was argued, but we did not succeed in persuading the international community that it was the, the right direction at the time. But the fact is that there were private entities and governments that were prepared to begin the process of investment. In a sense, I was persuaded by the then occupant of that ministry with responsibility for climate matters, Dr. Fletcher at the time, who insisted that the term sustainable development was a far better term and the ministry should be named sustainable development. I have not had conversations with him recently over issues of climate change and, and environment, etc. But I often wonder whether he now regrets the decision that we did not name the ministry as a Ministry of Environmental Affairs, uh, as Ministry of Climate Change and Environment Affairs, and now you could have added, if you wanted, to the blue economy. And I believe that even if time has elapsed, that in some future configuration of ministries, 
we can begin to move in that direction because if we do so, then we'll be taking a major step forward in persuading the international community how serious we are about climate issues. And such a step would be far more important, for example, than giving this, this legislation, the, um, giving the, the protocols the force of law in this legislation, which I shall come to in, in a few minutes because it bothers me. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I hope, as I said, that when we look to the future, we look at this configuration, that we can take the lead in doing so, because if we can do so, then our capacity to mobilize funding would be even better, would be enhanced. And the reality is that the time has come for us to, to move in that direction precisely because of what faces our country and the, the, the Eastern Caribbean and the world um, over. Having said this, Mr. Speaker, I just simply want to to emphasize how timely this piece of legislation is. And I'm certain that very near into the future that the ministry would want to return to this legislation, make adjustments, because it's, it's on the, the, the agenda, the climate agenda is unfolding. And we have to expect that changes will come fast and furious and so too will be the bureaucracy that we create to manage um, climate change. It's interesting that the um, minister made the point about definitions and terms in, in, in the legislation. And um, I understood fully that we have to use the vocabulary of the era, the language of the day. Um, but at the same time, I just wished and hoped that there could have been far greater clarity in the use of some of the terms used in the definitions described because I really do believe that this is a piece of legislation that even our school children need to come to terms with. Of course you can argue that um, they too have to understand the lexicon of the day, the lexicon of climate change and when they hear others speak about it, your Greta, Thun, um, your, your Greta Thunbergs and others, whatever, I think that's a correct name, if I, if I do recall. Um, but that being the case, and you have to adjust to this vocabulary, how pleasing it would have been if, if it were possible for far more um, elegant and simpler terms to be used. And when you look at the definition of climate change in the legislation, it says means a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to anthropogenic activity. <laughs> anthropogenic activity. Is that a correct pronunciation? Is it? <laughs> I don't think you can escape that possibility to, to tell us what it is. But, Mr. Speaker, you didn't begin to understand what I'm saying because but then that is the lexicon, lexicon of the day. And then if you go further, um, greenhouse gas means a gaseous compound in the atmosphere that is capable of absorbing infrared radiation. Of course, young scientists may know what these terms mean, but I, I wonder about the young school children who have to be told what well, this is infrared radiation and I can go on and on. Now, Mrs. Speaker, I'm just saying that, um, you know, we need to popularize le legislation that has a major impact on our lives and wherever we have that opportunity, we need to do so. I regret, Mrs. Speaker, I did not have a personal conversation with the minister regarding this piece of legislation. I suspect um, neither of us really had the time to make contact or have a little chat on these are not by way of criticisms really um, I think it is more in the nature of observations um, for the next round when we are um, looking at the unfolding story of climate change but there are one or two little things Mr. Speaker if you look at page 8 on the definition of loss and loss and damage, um, I think 
I don't know, but I can never always said that people who draft legislation have different philosophies, different approaches to things and, and, and so on. And I mean, I, I love the music of language. I'm not gifted in language, Mr. Speaker. I'm not gifted, but I love its music, I love its cadence, I love its, I, I love its flow, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I often used to say to my colleagues, and maybe I shouldn't make a public statement, but, and because people will use it against me, because they perhaps they'll ascribe certain things they didn't understand before. I remember you saying to them, Mr. Speaker, when I had the honor to serve as Prime Minister of this country, that there were moments in my life as a Prime Minister when I became a little bored with being Prime Minister. I actually became bored because you were dealing with some of the, you were dealing with the same things over and over and over and over and over. And if you were like me, put in a position where you had to receive certain calls every morning, um, long calls complaining about every living thing in this country and calls which never identified one thing positive that was occurring in the country, then you can imagine how depressing this must all be. But you had to be Prime Minister to understand those things. And those who thought that being Prime Minister was uh, the, the, you know, the, the ultimate, maybe they're not beginning to understand, or they have understood, and I'm referring to all the Prime Ministers in recent years, what's involved. I remember last night I was having a conversation with somebody and so the person was saying to me, they wonder how Prime Minister Pierre is sleeping at night. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I laughed, well, and I said, well, I've known him for years and I know he has a habit, he goes to bed late. Um, he used to wander all over the place when he was a minister. Um, so, and judging by the messages you may receive at night, he does wander late. So, uh, perhaps he sleeps well, but in that jest, I'm just poking fun at him. But the reality is that the issues that face you, the challenges, are so consuming that you know, getting peace of mind is a very real issue. And I dealt with those moments of boredom that I had by drafting legislation. I actually drafted legislation, sat and reviewed legislation, and actually crafted. Um, legislation, and I can remember several pieces of legislation that I then sat with attorneys general and actually drafted. So you see, there is a, so a music to language, of, uh, a beauty to language, and um, to come back to it, Mr. Speaker, to zero in on the point, there's a definition of loss says in relation Loss in relation to loss and damage means an irreversible and permanent impact of climate change. Now, again, it goes back to philosophy of language. Loss in relation to climate change is like taking loss out of loss and damage and giving it separate meaning. But then just below that is a definition of loss and damage means the economic and non economic experienced impacts of climate change despite mitigation and adaptation efforts. Um, so that in effect, loss is not irreversible after all. Loss, there could be loss that is reversible. So why then have a definition, loss in relation to loss and damage means an irreversible and permanent impact of climate change? That kind of, you can have loss that is irreversible, but that is only one aspect of the concept of loss. Would it not have been simpler and better to say, to absorb loss under the concept of loss and damage, and simply say loss and damage means the economic and non-economic experience impacts of climate change despite mitigation and adaptation efforts, and also include irreversible and permanent impact of climate change. Again, I don't know, Mr. Speaker, philosophy, but it seems to me it looks a little clumsy in the approach that we are using. But I don't know the lexicon. The minister does. So perhaps the minister can, is in a position to say, well, it's necessary for reasons A, B, and C. And uh, the Attorney General might I say that, as he usually says to me, well, um, you know, um, 
my drafters and my, my officers say X, Y, and Z, and at that point, what are you going to, what are you going to do? Um, but I'm just saying I haven't had the opportunity <laughs> to discuss this with him, but these are the little things I think that jump out. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, having touched on these little minor, minor matters, I want to just direct attention to a very important clause in this bill. And I'm very serious. It does cause me a little anxiety. And it's a little unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that sometimes you only see these things on the eve of the debate in the House. It's clause three, the force of law. The clause says the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has a force of law in St. Lucia. The Kyoto Protocol has a force of law in St. Lucia. The Paris Agreement has a force of law in St. Lucia. A protocol or an agreement made under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to which St. Lucia is a party has a force of law in St. Lucia. I confess, Mr. Speaker, I confess openly. I am one of those lawyers, academics at one time, as an academic at one time, who oppose the enforceability of international conventions in domestic jurisdictions unless there are overwhelming reasons to do so. I have always felt uncomfortable by the imposition of international law because it undermines the sovereignty of individual states. I don't subscribe to it and there must be good reason. As far as I'm concerned. But that is an isolated view and I have argued it with eminent counsel and with eminent lawyers and so on and practitioners of public international law which is not a body of law I have much regard for. I confess all my sins Mr. Speaker. I confess all my sins in that regard. But I'll tell you why I have issues with this. I don't know whether all nations will go as far as to make all these conventions the force of law. Give them the force of law. Because you have to remember, in this same piece of legislation, we also say, I believe, in Clause 5, that this act binds the Crown, which means that the Crown, the state of St. Lucia, is bound by these protocols, etc. Now, what, are, what is the implication? It means, ultimately, that any citizen of this country can, in fact, sue the government of St. Lucia for not observing or implementing any of those conventions. That's what it means. And life has been made easier these days because in the revised rules of civil procedure in St. Lucia, and this is an amazing development, I don't even think you all are aware of around this table. I don't even think you are aware of it. That the Chief Justice has made new rules or made some changes to the civil procedure rules. And one of the major changes is that you do not require leave anymore to challenge the decisions of ministers or public authorities or public functionaries. Before, it was a two-stage process. First, you had to apply for leave to bring the action. We call it leave for judicial review. And if the court agrees that there is a valid case, of a prima facie case, and there is um, a, a case to argue, then the court will say, all right, I am going to grant you leave, and then you get leave to um, deal with a substantive matter or the substantive complaint. It was like a sieve. It was not, sorry, like, now it's, 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 it's not even a sieve. The doors are wide open. So you don't have to apply to the court for leave for judicial review. You just apply directly to the court for an ad ad the usual administrative orders of the judicial review. 
and then the court will decide on the merits of the case your position is. Which means basically that um, if ministers commit infractions, um, no longer can the Attorney General put up the initial defense, but this, this is not a, a suitable matter for judicial review. And the courts have liberalized what you call local standard. They have liberalized um, the, the rights of complainants to appear before it. The courts are no longer interested in whether you really have a relevant interest in the matter to bring the matter to court. I mean, yes, <laughs> I mean, when you I mean, consider what happened in the Rochamel case and when um, then counsel brought a challenge on the Rochamel case, we had to go through these, 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 these processes whether leave should be granted. And of course, the government has to decide whether they oppose the grant of leave or not. But it, uh, then it was a procedural safeguard that prevented busybodies from going to the courts and arguing all kinds of specious, specious cases. So now the, the, the doors are wide open. And this is a problem with this because, you see, once you, you um, ascribe the force of law, then what it does mean is that if you're not going to keep your commitments in respect of these very various protocols, then you are open to be challenged. That's the implication. But there's a deeper problem for me, Mr. Speaker, and it is this. We all know that what was agreed in Paris is not being implemented by nations. We know that for a fact. We know that there have been several agreements, protocol after protocol, but nations are not observing or implementing or ascribing any importance to a lot of these protocols. So what are you going to do? Because the reality is that we are ascribing to ourselves a seriousness because nations want us to do it, to show that we're serious about climate change, but they themselves are not observing those protocols. And we have gone to the extreme now of saying these things have the force of law in our country, and it binds the crown. Now, again, I don't know what the philosophy is, and I, I regret I um, didn't have a chance to, to do the kind of reflection, but that I am just saying that these are issues that we need to think about very carefully when we are attempting to, to um, impose those conventions um, on our country and ascribing to a legislative force. And I don't know, we were talking about memory today, we have been chatting on, about memory and so on. And I don't know if my former cabinet colleagues will remember that whenever, and I see the Minister of External Affairs is looking at me intently, he has a way, when he suspects I'm about to touch on some matter, touching his ministry, he looks at me intently and as if to say, now what are you going, going to come in with, or what is it you're going to tell me, um, etc. Um, he abandons his aviation posture. He is no longer preparing to land or anything like that, or look into the skies to determine which airplane is going to land. He looks at me. But only I'm going to make a simple non-contentious point, and that was that if you remember very well, whenever he presented one of those conventions to cabinet for approval, he always met in me a certain reluctance to go along with it and to approve it and put it into law. So this is nothing new I'm saying. It's been an article of faith because I used to resent the fact that these international obligations were putting obligations on small states like ours and we did not have the resources to, 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 to satisfy or meet these obligations because we were being oppressed by these larger states. So, it's nothing new to me, but um, my article of faith, that's, that's what I believe. And I just think we have to be exceedingly careful. Um, true, true, very true, Mr. Speaker. When 
countries see this and they look at St. Lucia, they say, that is the example we want. Yeah. That is the right example. St. Lucia is leading the way. The question is, at what cost? That's the issue. So, Mr. Speaker, I have a few little reservations. The third thing I want to say, and this one perhaps um, the Attorney General may, may want to, to reflect on this. Mr. Speaker, I believe that some of the objectives are very, very laudable. I really, really, really do. If you look at clause four, Mr. Speaker, it has a, a compendium of sub provisions, and, and, and look at it. It says in clause four, D, the purpose of this act are to support the integration of climate change considerations into existing and new sectoral laws, policies, strategies, plans, standards, guidelines, criteria, programs, projects, and processes. F. Institute measures to reduce the vulnerability of the people and ecosystems to the adverse effects of climate change. And you can go on and very laudable. Now, if you look at the functions of the department, which have been very carefully, very carefully worded, um, the department's functions, as you will see, Mr. Speaker, says without prejudice to the functions of another ministry or department, careful wording, the functions of the department are, and then they go through it um, in some detail. Um, really interesting. And if you look at um, G, formulate and review policies and guidelines for climate change and measures and actions. A on climate change, mitigation, adaptation, climate displacement, loss and damage, planned relocation to encourage scientific and technological research, the development, transfer and deployment of technologies, equipment and processes for climate change, mitigation and adaptation. And I mean, this is very all embracing. And then if you go down to H, in the case of green gas emission reduction, Incidentally, I want to tease the minister in a few minutes. Um, a range of things, provision is made in J for collaboration, K-L-M-N-O-P. Now, I'll tell you what bothers me, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what bothers me. Um, there is absolutely no reference, no guidance, on the issue of physical infrastructure to deal with the vulnerability of climate change. We are not closing the department with the power to recommend even policies on infrastructure and physical development to deal with issues of climate change. Now, you will tell me in response, the drafters will tell me in response, but I just like to make noise. Um, all of that is implied. All of that is implied in the legislation. In typical Kenny Anthony, it is not there. Um, he, you don't need it because it's implied. That is a usual response. But let me give a warning to this house. I am in the courts of solution. I have had the experience in a labor matter where when the Labor Act was being presented, there was a section in that Labor Act that on presentation I indicated that the intention of a specific provision was that issues that employees, employees of public authorities like statutory boards, Castries Constituency Council, would be exempted from the provisions of the Labor Act in respect of matters of their termination and discipline. They are not public officers uh, for those purposes. They are not to be treated, sorry. They are to be treated as public, the other way around. They are to be treated as public authorities or public servants 
are employees of the Crown and therefore these matters should not be handled by, by the, um, by the Labour Commissioner or in fact the Labour Tribunal. And the court ruled against me. The court said that's not the meaning of the section. <laughs> and you know the lesson? Of course I went on to win the case subsequently. And the person whom I represented was able to secure reasonable damages for the wrong that had been committed. But what struck me was that here was Parliament in its deliberation saying, well, that's what the section means. That is what we intend. And the court is telling you, no, you are wrong. That's not what. And what is worse is that I sat, I sat on the chair and I was the one pointing out what the section was intended to do. What are you going to tell a judge? And by the way, he was a very bright judge. What are you going to tell him? You then go and sit down and tell him, but your other, I was in parliament, I'm the one who presented the legislation, I didn't mean it to say that, and I told my colleagues that's not what it meant. You can't put that and say that in court. Of course, you can appeal the decision, but as you know, sometimes you have to live with decisions, you know that are wrong, because clients just don't have the wealth at all. Sometimes you have to fight on principle. But it's not all the time I have the energy to fight on principle, Mr. Speaker. Don't look at the clock, Mr. Speaker. I'll soon finish. Don't worry, Mr. Speaker. You have to go down to Miku Sassi, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think it's a critical and crucial issue. It is to the credit of this government, Mr. Speaker, and it goes back to our tenure in 2011, that we have been building, for example, climate resilient bridges in this country. We took a decision, we made a decision in 2011, that any bridge to be built in St. Lucia must satisfy climate resilience because we can no longer afford a situation where bridges were being torn asunder by rising waters, be it rivers or otherwise. And you saw that policy being given expression in the bridge, Badawash. Two bridges, Grand Riviere, the Alba Bridge, the Tomaso Bridge. That policy being in the PI Bridge when I signed the agreement for the PI Bridge. Also, when I signed the agreement with then Prime Minister of Japan for that bridge that is in Kaldisak, and I've told the Minister I hope we have the courage to name that bridge after the Prime Minister involved Shinzo Abe because of that very generous grant. Japan deserves it because of the investment they have made. And I hope we can name the bridge after him, the Shin Shinzo Abe Bridge, because it is a, fascina it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating piece of, of, of architecture. It's a very nice bridge. I, don't, I can't see much for the road next to it, but... <laughs> yeah. Now, and now, that new, ge those, the new generation of bridges, apart from Piai, we now have canneries and hopefully ancillary. And, you know, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I, I, he I heard members waxing eloquently today, and um, some made references constantly about the future, which, which we have to talk about all the time. But, and we do things as politicians, and people don't understand why. They don't appreciate the value of it. I mean, but something will happen sometime that suddenly will resonate and people will see the importance of what we do, you know. You must never give up. Never ever give up. Never ever give up. Don't give up on people. No matter how cruel they are to you and how abusive they are to you, don't give up on them. Never ever do that. You're a young politician and you don't understand, but it's all right. They'll come around and they'll understand someday. So they, they are beginning to understand those very bridges. Yeah, everybody's praising the PI Bridge because of the cultural symbols, quite rightly. 
Everybody is to be applauded for that. I think it's a step in the right direction. And the Minister of Tourism said it right. That we have to allow our personalities to come through the architecture of our buildings. Of course, I know I'll have more to say on that in due course. And I may say on some things that are unpleasant, but um, it'll be consistent with that philosophy. That being said, Mr. Speaker, um, I do not believe a matter as important as that should be left to the Ministry of Planning. You see that, Ministry of Planning? I don't believe a matter like that should be left to them. Um, I wish we could have had a debate on the Ministry of Depart the, the <laughs> Department of Physical Planning and the Planning Authorities in this country. I wish we could have had a debate on that. Something will happen for us to have a debate, to have a discussion on that department. But that should not be left to them, because you see, in this bill, um, we are, the minister has correctly understood he has a minefield. He can't dictate, he can't direct to ministries, but what he has done skillfully, and this drafter may have helped him on this occasion, so I applaud the drafter, is to allow him or her the, 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 the authority and the power to make prescriptions, to issue, to issue guidelines. Now, what I'm saying is that either the department, under the provisions governing the department, maybe a gentle amendment could be made um, to say something like um, that the department will issue guidelines for physical infrastructure in vulnerable, um, in vulnerable um, areas, or some such thing, some such language, something like this. And that physical infra infrastructure should not just be roads and bridges, but also should be buildings. Now, I believe that the member for Castries North is getting my drift. Because you can't tell me in this age of climate change you're going to put up a Wasco building with glass if you vote south next to a major beach. How do you justify that? How do you justify that? Now, Mr. Speaker, the minister is absolutely correct, Mr. Speaker, to identify Viewfort as a vulnerable area. And I have spoken about this matter before. I don't know if we're taking it seriously, you know. I don't know if Slasper is taking it seriously. I really don't know. I don't know if Invest in Dusha is taking this matter very seriously. I don't know how many people know how many feet above the um, sea level of Viewfort that section in Viewfort really is and how vulnerable it is. And the member for Castries East will tell you when he was Minister of Infrastructure that he had a taste for it when we had that famous weather system that tore apart what Viewfortians insist must be maintained as part of their patrimony. The concrete road next to Sandy Beach that the, f that the former Prime Minister was intent on destroying because he had to teach Viewfortians a lesson. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is this. No infrastructure should ever be allowed on Sandy Beach or that area close to Sandy Beach, tourism or no tourism. That should be a no building zone, period. The minister speaks of decades. I think he's wrong. I think he's wrong. The effects of rising waters will be sooner than decades. And Beaufort will be the first to suffer. As a matter of fact, I am saying now that as part of the process of our forward thinking to deal with issues of climate change, we should prepare a relocation plan for the inhabitants of Beaufort 
whether you don't do it tomorrow is done the day after but land should be reserved to move the people of Beaufort from that piece of land between the area of Mula Sheik and of course going beyond the airport to Beaufort North. That is what forward thinking means and that is what adaptation and that is what resilience means and that is what it means prepared for climate change. God forbid, God forbid that we have to face a major earthquake and the people I don't know, Mr. Speaker, whether I'll be alive when these things happen. I don't know the rate at which things are going. I'm a little mortified these days, but you know, Mr. Speaker, um, these are things, these are realities we have to come face to face to. We shouldn't be putting any more buildings so close to that area. Rather, what we should be doing is to protect it to the best of our abilities. And the northern part of the runway is particularly susceptible that I'm not too sure that a good job is being done to maintain it. I've raised this matter with the Ministry of Infrastructure. I've raised it with Slasper, but you know Slasper don't take me on. No. 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 For years I've been telling them to clean up, they and invested Lucia to clean up the road leading to the airport. It can't be right that the people of St. Lucia have to be driving along a road like that and the road is in that state with all kind of old buildings, all kind of vehicles at the side of the road on their way to our international airport. But you know, they leave it there. But you know, I'll tell you something. I have, what, two and a half years ago? Two and a half years ago? Let's stand. This time, you know, there, there comes a time when you're tired of talking and talking and talking and talking, Mr. Speaker. I spoke about the value of repetition this morning. You see, I'm raising this issue all the time. Which one? Which part I'm referring to? I am referring to that section from the quarry going driving into the airport wow. on the right side. I have asked for that quarry to be closed down because of the damage it's doing to the health of the people of Euphort. When I had the pleasure to serve as the Prime Minister of this country, I ordered it to be closed. They closed it, the next government came in, they promptly reopened it. They have disfigured that mountain. That mountain was part of the patrimony of you for they disfigured it. And you must think I must be emotional about these things. Because you warn them, you talk to them. You talk, well, you know. And, and, and the minister who is responsible for plan, please tell the Ministry of Planning, I don't want no more billboards in Beaufort. It's disfiguring my constituency. I'm fed up with the billboards. Go and put the billboards in other constituencies that want decorations. Take them out. I don't know whether it's Labri or Miku South or North or whatever the case is, but take out the billboards from my constituency. Now, Mr. Speaker, I hope what I'm trying to say is understood. And maybe the minister in his reply will say to me, I must not worry because now that I have this legislation, I will prepare mitigation plans. But we have to begin to think further. And that is why I have to say to the member for Castries, I am so petrified about the future and the safety of Giwanora International Airport. That's why we have to make wise decisions regarding the expansion of the airport. And when you see a, a terminal building was being put in an exact area which used to be an old um, river water course, it has to be madness, utter madness. That is why you have the back of day in the state that it is because water continues to leak from the river beneath the airport, finding itself over there. That's why that place can never dry. You remember, for Labri understands what I'm talking about, because in his, when the days when he used to work at the airport in his border, he used to look across at back and then the river there to be distracted. Not so? I know your habits. <laughs> but these are the realities that we face.
That being said, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the Attorney General will just take that comment in stride and see whether we can have it. It doesn't have to be done today, but there are ways of doing it. You think about it, and um, maybe it can be done in the Senate, but at least a provision to enhance the capacity of the department to give guidelines regarding physical infrastructure, including buildings, roads, bridges, etc. You cannot leave those things, and don't tell me it's implied. Because the implication is not strong enough. And Section 25, well, we'll come to that in a minute. I'll come there in a minute. So, you understand, um, Mr. Speaker, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, because we haven't start, we have in fact started to practice some of those things. When we build a new generation, I call them a new generation, a new generation of bridges. And you have seen the evidence of it. Every time I pass on the Alba Bridge, I marvel at it. Well, it's in your, it is in your constituency, but I remember it was the then Minister of Infrastructure um, who was faithful to, um, to the discussions we had regarding this new generation of build, uh, bridges. And he was criticized a lot. But everybody applauds that, that bridge today. Everybody. Now, I want to go briefly to Clause 18. Read it, Mr. Speaker. Look, take a look at Clause 18. The department shall, in collaboration with the committee, coordinate the development of climate change adaptation policy every 10 years. Now, that can't be for real. Because <laughs> climate change issues are developing so rapidly that, I mean, you, you Really, this is something that should be looked at every two, three years. And I don't know if this slip, this slip, the, the minister, I don't know if it slipped the, the minister. And look at it, it is reproduced in clause 19. The department shall coordinate the development and updating of a national adaptation plan at least every 10 years. You will become obsolete. By then, you, you would be up totally, totally um, obsolete. What I find the act does is to perhaps give an institutional focus onto itself. And maybe there's excessive institutional focus so that these vital things are looked at. Now, <laughs> a little perhaps um, Distraction. Take a look at clause 21, greenhouse <laughs> Member for Vivot South, you have 15 minutes left. How many more? 15, one five. Oh, okay. Hi, right, Mr. Speaker. I didn't realize I'd spoken for an hour. And time has a way, almost an hour, but anyhow, I'll, I'll come to that. Take a look at clause 21. The department shall, after consultation with the committee and other experts, keep and maintain a greenhouse gas inventory. The greenhouse gas inventory under subsection 1 must show a periodical estimate of human-induced emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse, greenhouse gases. I thought this was very interesting because how are you, how are you really going to go about measuring emissions in seclusion and determine the human contribution to it because I mean the reality is that what we are suffering basically um, is because of emissions induced by the developed countries. They're the cause of our problems, you know. We are making things worse by some of the things that we do here in Seleucia. And I'm happy you mentioned the issue of replanting trees and you have to hurry up about it. When we were, when I had the honor to be in the former government, I kept on pushing replanting trees, plant more mahogany trees, plant more teak, do so quickly. Let the young people go in the forest and plant trees. 
The fellows who are roaming and have nothing to do, give them plants, send them in the forest, populate the country with trees, please. They bought, they have nothing to do, send them in the forest, give them a pickaxe, give them a good spade, and so on, and let them go and plant some trees, spend a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. Why? Because this country is needed because of the damage caused by bananas. We are running away from the damage caused by bananas. The contamination of our water table is due to the banana industry. And we don't want to talk about it. But we have to replant the trees that they destroy. Now, I'm asking, how do you measure these emissions? Now, on a lighter note, on a lighter note, I know, of course, a lot of the problems we have with methane gas. It's produced by cattle dung, isn't it? And in Europe, there is a big movement, a huge movement to reduce the consumption of cattle, of a beef, so as to cut back on the emissions, because they are the most efficient producers of emissions. The member for Miku South, check the member for um, Sufra, Mrs. Speaker, she's looking at me and asking me where I get that from. She has not, did you know that? Did you know that, you didn't know that cattle is a major cause of emissions? The dog, cattle dog? Yeah. I wish you were in my classroom. Yeah. It's a major cause. <clears throat> and you know what I wondered? I said to myself, we do not, we do not, isn't that so? So, so why are you pushing cattle production? <laughs> I'm just teasing. We do not have the population of cattle in St. Lucia to be alarmed about. But I'm just saying to you that in a couple of years time, the onslaught against cattle production will commence. You know, I, I envisage a time in the next 10, 15 years when human beings will be asked to consume leaves alone. Human beings, leaves. But you're already doing so. You're eating cabbage, you're eating lettuce. Fellas already tell you, um, you have to try as part of your, your diet, your, 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 your diet, um, potato leaves. In Africa, potato leaves is a big part of the diet in Africa. They take the potato leaves, the sweet potato leaves, and they stew it nicely, you know, with a little seasoning pepper, and a little oil. And you'd be amazed when you eat it. You'd never think you were eating. Have you tried it? Of course I did. I do it at home. Have you tried it? Well, when you go to Africa, spend your time wisely and look at some of the... <laughs> <laughs> I look at some of the dietary practices. Because you see, that's going to be the reality. And I did tell you that this is a moment of levity, but it's a very serious matter. Because it is not that methane gas is a problem here in St. Lucia, but what is going to happen outside in the wider world will eventually go into, go into impact. But, Minister, and I think politics, we should have to learn to laugh in politics. There are moments of levity we need to uh, do there. How are you going to sell a message to cattle farmers that their cattle is producing methane and <laughs> what are you going to tell them? How are you going to tell them? <laughs> well, you know, on a more serious note, might, maybe you might have been helped in a way you did not realize. The member for Miku South he destroyed the cattle industry in Beaufort. <laughs> Remember that? Beaufort is no longer the primary producer of cattle in this country because of what they did. That's a tragedy. And I have endless elderly farmers on my hands whose livelihoods have been destroyed by it. And we, we don't take those things seriously, but you know, when they try to explain to him and the people of St. Lucia the enormity of the damage 
unleashed on the people of Seleucia. They, they don't take it seriously. They think it's a joke. But he destroyed it. He destroyed the cattle farmers of Euphorus. So maybe you have been helped indirectly and you didn't know. But that's the reality of the situation. So, Mr. Speaker, that being said, I want to just mention briefly Clause 22. And just to emphasize the point I made earlier, if you look at Clause 22, it says the department shall, after consultation with the committee and other experts, set the greenhouse gas emission tar reduction target. It is a clause perhaps like this that might be useful in respect of the guidelines when I speak of building of future buildings and infrastructure. In other words, the capacity to issue guidelines about these buildings that becomes enforceable. Now, there is a possibility, as the member for Miku South said, under Clause 25. There's a possibility. Because I have, if you look at my copy here, it's marked. Mr. Attorney General, Clause 25 says, the minister may in consultation with the relevant minister develop standards and codes of practice as required to accelerate the response to climate change in accordance with the purposes. Now, drafters love this kind of provision because they get away with all their sins. They always tell you that there's a provision to cover nonsense. Nonsense! It is nonsense, Mr. Speaker, because they know full well that no recourse will ever have to deal with specific ministries or specific entities under this. They tell you the general power is there. Nonsense! If my point resonates with you, Mr. Attorney General, what you can do if you like is to amend this and put in a clause there to deal with this issue of physical information. It is too important to allow um, undefined and unregulated in this. The minister and his committees will never do what I'm talking about and this is too vague to allow this to happen and I really want to urge the speaker in all seriousness that that something be, be done in that regard and this is too big. But I know, speaker, whenever I stand up to speak about legislation, the people in my own party attack me and criticize me. You know, you know that, speaker? They tell you, oh, I come to parliament, I come to criticize the government. Why didn't I tell the government that before? And I know there are even other colleagues who share that kind of view. Let me tell you all something. You see Senosha? Senosha have the is it walls? Be careful. You never know who you're talking to. You go and sit down at a dinner in one of the hotels or elsewhere and you talk and talk. You don't know who you're talking to. You don't know who is the relative of who. You don't know who is the friend of who. You don't know who went to bed with who. That's the harsh reality of your society. So when you see, I come in this chamber and I make oblique references, don't feel that I don't know. Don't feel because I say it that I'm not aware of it. But you know, Speaker, it reflects so many things. The lack of understanding of, of the, the role of a backbencher in, in, in the parliament, the lack of appreciation sometimes, to understand that some points don't come to you immediately, that it takes a little while before. And, uh, and it is not intended to mount an assault on the government or the attorney general or the minister. These little things along the passage you, 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 of time you pick up. So, Mrs. Speaker, I, I actually applaud the legislation. The minister is creating a bureaucracy, it is true. And I don't like bureaucracy, I have attacked bureaucracy, that we love too much bureaucracy. He's creating a bureaucracy, but then he has to make a start. 
And I hope that as time goes along, he may want to make adjustments because you see, bureaucracy is our enemy. It is our enemy, enemy. Everything in St. Lucia now, because you know why? We don't trust each other no more. We have lost the ability of good administration, so everything we want is rules and procedure. I'm sure you're a victim of that in your ministry. Yes? Yes? You want advice? <laughs> but you'll never come to me for advice because what I tell you, you wouldn't want to follow it. But that's the reality that we have in this country, Mr. Speaker. So it is, in a sense, a bureaucracy is creating, but an understandable bureaucracy. But minimize future problems by getting it right. We have to tackle this problem of infrastructure in this country. And trust me, you will, if we do so, you will give confirmation that as a government we were ahead of our, ahead of our time. This Labour Party has always been ahead of its time. That's one of the strengths we have had. And when I hear all of you, you don't realize it, but you're confirming we are ahead of our time. When we gave out laptops, we were ahead of our time. We understood where these things were going. We understood where the world was going. When we decided to fight cable and wireless and decentralize communications and create a competitive environment, we were ahead of our time. Member for Fort South, yes, five I, minutes. Yes, I'm ahead of my time. Five minutes to conclude <laughs> your presentation. I'm ahead of my time, Mr. Speaker. All I'm saying to my colleagues, confirm we are ahead of our time and let's continue to live ahead of our time by doing what is right and doing what is bold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.